Paris hosts the games this summer, but it's in a city founded by the ancient Greeks where it all begins the Olympic flame arriving in the Mediterranean port of Marseille, the start of a long journey to the July 26th opening ceremonies here in the French capital. What's it all about? After all, the torch relay hasn't always been part of the pageantry. Organizers insist it's not political, but also boast of the values they purvey. What are those values? Does it resonate, for instance, when the leaders of the last host nation, China, and the next host nation, France, together call for an Olympic truce during the Games? What does a global spectacle like this one mean in these post-pandemic times, in the midst of so many conflicts and fractures across the planet? To what point will Paris 2024 mirror the triumphs and challenges of our present day on this planet? Today in the France 24 debate, we're asking what's at stake. Are the Olympics more than just games? With us from Marseille, France 24's Selena Sykes, who's uh, watching it all. Selena, uh, what's the latest where you are? Francois, the spectacle has well and truly begun here in the old port of Marseille. We've just had fireworks and uh, La Marseillaise uh, sung as the bellum is slowly but surely making its grand entrance uh, here in the old port. Uh, Florent Manadou already has the torch in his hands. Uh, just about uh, 40 minutes to go now until his descent uh, on dry land here in Marseille with the Olympics torch. Selena Sykes, who's going to be charting it all for us throughout the hour. From New York, two-time French super lightweight boxing champion. He'll be one of the torchbearers. Uh, Yurik Mamadov, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be part of it. It's an amazing opportunity to have it uh, holding in Paris. It's amazing. It is amazing indeed. Historian uh, Lindsay Krasnoff, adjunct instructor at NYU Tisch Institute for Global Sports. You are the author of uh, Basketball Empire, France and the Making of a Global NBA and W uh, NBA. That's the Women's uh, Professional League over, over in the U.S. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, he has covered, he covered the last games in Tokyo where there were no fans. Uh, sports <laughs> reporter Andrea Sevagora, I'm sure looking forward to these ones. I am. Evening, Francois. How are you? Uh, Financial Times columnist Simon Cooper, author of uh, Impossible City, Paris in the 21st Century. Uh, your latest book uh, sounds like another bit of puff beast journalism, as Simon there. <laughs> it's about the beauty and the horror of Paris, all the good and the bad that we know so well. All right, so there's good and bad. Your reactions, by the way, on the hashtag F24 debate. From Mount Olympus to Marseille is only the start of it. 79 days until the Games. Make way for the torchbearers. Solange Mougin has more. As it makes its journey to Paris, the Olympic flame will be passed to some 11,000 people. Many will be athletes. After swimmer Laure Manadou in Greece, her brother and fellow swimmer was chosen to carry the flame in Marseille. Basketball star Tony Parker will also run with the Olympic torch on May 9th. Former football stars Basil Boli and Didier Drogba will also carry it, as will pole vaulter Jean Galfion and rugby man Romain and Tamac. There are also amateur athletes like Colombian chef Juan Arbelez, who's honored to take part. Honestly, it's still hard to believe. The date's getting closer, too. It'll be the 20th of May. I feel like a kid who got a huge surprise at Christmas. For this athlete, it's an honor that takes her breath away. A free diver, Alice Modolo, will carry the flame through the depths of the Mediterranean Sea. But it's not just athletes that will carry the Olympic flame. There's astronaut Thomas Pesquet, Miss France, famed chefs like Thierry Marx, as well as actress Charlotte Gainsbourg and comedian Jamel Debbouze. I can't wait, but I'm also nervous. It's a responsibility. I hope I won't trip. From one hand to the next, between everyday citizens and famous faces, the Olympic flame will slowly make its way across 450 villages in France before arriving July 26th in the City of Light. So, Yurik Mamadov, you're in New York right now. When, when are you coming over? Tell us when you're carrying the torch. Hi, yes, I'm currently in New York City because of my, uh, there's a league that's going on right now, so I can't, I can't move. But I'm going to be par in Paris uh, July 10, so I'm going to be holding the torch July 50, which is, uh, you know, a huge day for, national day for France, so I can't wait. 
July 14th. We're going to cross over to Marseille. We can see uh, uh, Selena. Uh, you've got uh, the Belém, which is carrying the torch behind you. It's a slowly but surely making its way uh, behind me any moment now. Hopefully it will uh, be behind me uh, in the old port of Marseille. Right, we'll, this we'll, moment we'll cross of course, back to you, Selena. has been waiting for. We'll cross right, we'll cross right back to you. Uh, Yurik, just, okay. just tell me your story is a second here because you uh, um, are uh, born in Russia. Uh, you're of Yazedi heritage. What does this mean? What, what is, the, for you, the significance of carrying the torch? No, first of all, I'm very grateful to be in this position where I am today. Like you say, you know, I travel a lot of countries from Russia to Armenia to Germany to France and currently living in the United States. And to me, to be able to represent France as an athlete, as a French athlete, and easily from my background, you know, my community went through a lot of, uh, you know, genocide in France. It's helping and giving us the opportunity, and not that as me, to represent France and the Yazidi by while I'm going to hold the torch. So it's, a, it's, an, it's an honor for me to be called as a French athlete on that day. So you'll be coming over when, and you'll be carrying it when? So I'm coming over July uh, 13, and I'm carrying July 15 in Paris. Into Paris. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Let's go back to Selena yeah. Sykes. So, Selena, do you see that boat? It's here now. I got a bit ahead of myself earlier on, but the Belle Emma <laughs> is uh, just behind me now, as you can see arriving over here. Of course, we're all waiting for it slowly but surely making its way through the old port where we'll obviously have that big moment, as I said, where Florent Manadou will touch down uh, on French soil with uh, the Olympics torture. But as you can see, it's just slowly making its way. And uh, obviously, the excitement is uh, off the scale right now here in Marseille. Excitement off the scale in Marseille. Now, just to remind our viewers, France no longer has an empire, but a torch relay is a way of reminding everyone that there's a lot to see, both near and far. Uh, you can see on this map uh, that between that, you see on the part on the, 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 the left side of the map there, it says uh, June 8th to 17th. Well, it's, it, it's going for one week uh, to overseas territories in Guyana, the Caribbean. Uh, the Indian and Pacific Oceans before uh, coming back. Uh, Simon Cooper, your, your thoughts on, on the journey of the Olympic flame? It's a lot like the Tour de France, of course, and the Tour de France for more than a century has existed partly to showcase the beauty of France, uh, this country where there are thousands of villages, every, each one with their own cheese and sausage, which... Um, Tourism is a huge part of this. So I think there'll be a hope that the whole world will catch glimpses of this and that it will be a kind of massive video ad for the French nation well beyond Paris. It's also a way of telling the French population this isn't just a Parisian show. All of you are involved. All of you are involved. Uh, uh, André Sevagora, the organizers have come in for a bit of heat over that, particularly uh, over the fact that they decided to stage uh, the uh, uh, surfing competition in Tahiti. Yeah, the surfing in Tahiti, apparently the, the, the waves weren't quite big enough down in, in, in Osegal, so uh, some terribly unlucky journalists have to go to Tahiti for a few weeks uh, for the Olympic Games. Look, organisers always come in for heat. This, is, this happens every, every year. There's always some problem or another, and there will be problems. I mean, this is the biggest event in the world. It's not the biggest sports event. It is the biggest event in the world, without a doubt, by a long way. Huge organisation. Things are going to go wrong. But in general, organizers pull it off. And I think the French probably will as well. And before the games, we talk up what's going wrong. Well, yeah, because no one's got anything else to talk about, have they? And this is one of the reasons there's a torch, is that for the Olympics, they need to give broadcasters like France Van Cat something to talk about, something to show, and get people excited because you can't... You and can't... are they excited? Is well, the torch really exciting? Well, I've never carried the torch. I know people who have, and they love it. And people on, on, on the course like watching it it's it's a lot of fun i'm not sure if we should think about it as too much more than that but the people who who are involved in it really enjoy it and it does it starts to get people thinking about the games so it's just a promotion for uh, a, a sporting event that's about to happen what's a torch relay about well i think it's also symbolically linking the kind of history of the games and the legacy of the games to the present but also the you know starting the next chapter for the next generation and these games and beyond and here I'm thinking very much about how at 
Paris 2024, we're going to have the introduction of breaking as one of the new sports very much designed to meet one part of the Olympic Agenda 2020, a focus on youth and bringing more youth into the Olympic movement. Um, you know, break dancing, breaking, um, they have their Olympic qualifiers this month and next month. Uh, 80 different participants are competing for those last slots here in Paris. And when I've gone on the, uh, the, the web portal to try to get tickets, they're all gone. Right. So some sports uh, coming into favor, others uh, coming out of favor. Yurik Mamedov, there were questions about boxing at the Olympics uh, over whether or not it should remain a sport. Like, actually, I, I hope it's going to be part of the Olympic because it's one of the most beautiful sports I believe in, in the world. And uh, I don't know why it shouldn't be part of it. You know, it, I know it's not an easy sport to watch. And it's not a like a, it's, it can look very aggressive, but it's an R first. You know, we call it it's a chess match. So it's, I believe that we give the opportunity for the fans to see boxing at the highest level and maybe have a positive view of boxing in the world. Uh, is the Olympics about tradition or is it about introducing things that are new as was just described there by Lindsay Krasnov? Jurek, your thoughts? So I believe it, it is a tradition. You know, I've been doing this for years. And I believe every new sport going to be part of it should be introduced as much as possible and be, you know, introduced to the public as the way of, it's part of, you know, one of the most beautiful sports in the, in the world, which is boxing. So hopefully people will have an idea and understanding of how beautiful is the sport of boxing besides the aggressivity and the intensity of, you know, two people fighting each other. Simon Cooper, the the... When you think of the Olympic traditions, how do you rank the, this whole torchbearer uh, uh, course that, we've, uh, that, we, that we outlined earlier? Of course, it was invented by the Nazis in 1936 for the Berlin Olympics. And so there's that rather horrible heritage. I think they were trying to connect it to older Greek traditions from the ancient Olympics. But of course, the pageantry of it really does work. You know, mostly these athletes with beautiful bodies running through spectacular landscape with a torch. So um, cinematically, it's brilliant. I think the history of it um, is so dark as to um, re require quite a lot of thoughts and study, I think. Uh, Andres Evagora? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with Simon, but the Olympics is all about symbols, isn't it? That's what makes it different from other sports events. It's the opening ceremony, the closing ceremony, the rings, the torch, the anthems. I mean, these have really bound up so much in the Olympics, and without those, it would just be any other sporting event. So to answer your question about it, they have to keep the traditions, yes, but at the same time, it needs to be kept relevant, to use that horrible word, with the younger audience, because that is the big challenge for the Olympics. Like, the, the Olympic audience is like kind of people our age, Francois, which is all good, <laughs> that's all great, but, you know, they need to get a younger audience. So they have brought in sports like breaking, which are considered interesting to, to younger fans. And... This event is going to be the proof in the pudding because the last two Olympics have been completely different because of COVID. So um, it's going to be really interesting to see what pans out this time. And how, how the, the crowds react. Uh, the torch relay, uh, you could say the same thing. It too uh, moves uh, with the times. Uh, there's going to be torch relay. One tor torch relay is 102, another that's 10 years old. And then there's 31-year-old Martin Namias, better known in Marseille as Miss Martini. This 31-year-old drag queen slated to carry the torch next Saturday in Provence. The day I carry the flame, I'll be obliged to wear the torchbearer's uniform, so I'll have a lovely white t-shirt and sweatpants. Wonderful for a drag queen, but I will accessorize it, and I'll nonetheless be flawless. I'll put on a nice belt, nice heels, an incredible wig that's arriving very soon, and after that we'll see what I'll wear on top, or not. Now this, uh, what is it, a hundred and, uh, I don't know how many nations uh, who are taking part in the uh, in the, the Olympics, not all of them share the same values as Miss Martini. No, um, and, but that's also one of the brilliant things about the Olympics, that it allows everyone to come together and have these you know, um, windows into other cultures, other countries. The Parade of Nations uh, in the opening ceremonies uh, certainly is one of that part. 
Uh, but it is, you know, getting back to one of the original foundations um, of the Olympic movement, bringing people together to foster greater friendship and understanding through the exchanges in and around the games. Is it about that, Yurik Mamadov, or once the games begin, is it just about who wins gold, silver, and bronze? First, I believe that every athlete who are part of the Olympic are winners already. This is a huge opportunity for every athlete in the world. We dream of being part of the you know, Olympics. So congratulations to everybody who's going to participate. And of course, you know, the goal is to win. But most important is to make sure that every athlete, you know, give them best. The, the, the audience can appreciate every sport they're going to watch it. And again, we have the best in the world competing. Well, we can't just expect, you know, the best against the best. So it's a great opportunity to, for audience to watch them perform. Right. Uh, we talk about traditions. Uh, I guess you could say one of the traditions we've seen in the run-up uh, came on Monday. It was a joint call in Paris for an Olympic truce. It was issued by the presidents of France and China, which hosted the last Winter Games. As a permanent member of the Security Council of the United Nations and as a responsible country, China is ready to work with France to take the Paris Olympics as an opportunity to call for a global truce during the Paris Olympic Games. These calls for an Olympic truce, is it just kind of window dressing or does it carry with um, I wouldn't underestimate, look, the idea that people are going like, to put down their guns during the Olympics, that's clearly for the birds. but. Russia did wait for the end of the last Winter Olympics to invade Ukraine. Waited a couple of weeks. Um, it's not quite a truce. I was lucky enough to be at the opening ceremony in 2018 for the Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang. That was genuinely one of the most emotional events I've seen because South and North Korean uh, athletes marched together. And it was a huge moment for the country. Now, whether things have developed since then is another thing. So. A truce in the pure sense of the word that people, look, we're in the, in the middle of wars in, in, in the Middle East, in Ukraine. I'd, I'd be amazed. I hope they do stop for the Olympics. I don't think they will. That doesn't mean that there isn't some room for understanding between countries in and around the games. And the Koreas is one example of that. But a, a truce in, in, the, in the terms that you're talking about, no, that's, that's not going to happen. Uh, Simon Cooper, uh, uh, floating the idea... Does it matter perhaps more than we think? I think to the contrary. I think Olympics and Football World Cups can be an opportunity for regimes to do things that they don't want the world to notice. So the media of the world will be consumed by what's happening in Paris. So if you want to uh, do a little, say, cleaning, as they call it, of uh, undesirable guerrillas or minority in your countries, or you want to prepare an invasion like Putin during the 2014 Sochi Olympics, it's a good time. Nobody's going to pay that much attention. So um, the cover of these sports events can be quite important. I also remember Saudi Arabia launching a massive offensive on Yemen. The war was already started, but the, the, there was a big offensive just as the World Cup 2018 started. So I think we need to be very suspicious of uh, what this kind of rhetoric is hiding in reality. Lindsay Krasnow? At the same time, I think it's important to understand that there can be dialogue that happens on the sidelines in and around these events, whether at the official ceremonies or as various different delegations meet and interact. So kind of what we would call, um, you know, these informal conversations within the sports diplomacy world can be facilitated by sporting mega events uh, such as the Olympics. Uh, so we, we, uh, there, there can be uh, this coming together, uh, is what you're saying. Um, the last time, by the way, we discussed the games on this show, it was the day of the inauguration of the Olympic Village. We've since had the christening of a new aquatic center. And this week, the opening of an extension of an RER rapid transit line uh, west of the capital. Uh, uh, it's always during the Olympics when you get the games, Andreas Evagora, there's the promise that there won't be any white elephants, uh, and then it doesn't always turn out to be the case. Oh, I think it almost turns out to be the, the case most of the time. We've, we've, we've had a lot of Olympics where the um, infrastructure is, is empty, disused, uh, you know, going back 
40 years, Athens, Montreal, you name it. I think Paris is a little bit better in as much as it was a little bit less ambitious. There's far less new infrastructure going in. If we're looking at sporting uh, stadia, um, there's the aquatic centre, one or two other places. Um, the Stade de France is getting a refit, which it probably needed anyway. So it's, it's com going to come in about 8 billion, which is n nothing compared to like Sochi, which was, what, 50 billion for the, the Winter Olympics. The last Winter Olympics in Beijing, you're looking 25, 30 billion. You know, you still ask the question, it's still 8 billion. That's a lot of money. Um, that's on the stadium side and, and the transport. Paris transport for me is deteriorating. I've lived in this city 25 years. There's no doubt it's deteriorating. Uh, I would hope that the Olympics is an opportunity to improve it. RER lines, yes, but if we're talking during the games, it's going to be crowded. I mean, 16 million visitors, that's a lot of people. Paris is a dense city. It's by most counts the most dense city in Europe. Um, it's good that the venues are close together. That means less traveling for, for everyone, but that can mean things will be more crowded. So as, as often, it's, it's, you know, it's a mixed picture. There'll be some positives, there'll be some negatives, but transport's going to be an issue. It, it is every, every year. Well, uh, um, Simon Cooper, let me ask you about this. Because the, the, the counterexample to Athens and all the white elephants that's often given is 1992 Barcelona. You talk to residents there today, they say how great the Olympics was because they, thanks to that, they upgraded tr public transport. They redid the port. Uh, they say that the, the benefits of the Olympics are still being felt. Looking ahead to Paris, what's your verdict? And Barcelona is a very different issue because it was a city that had had very little investment during the Franco regime for decades. And so from the 80s, post-Franco, needed a huge amount of investment, metro opening the, the city to the sea. It was great. It's one of the few Olympics that really improved the city. I think the impact of the Olympics on Paris long term is going to be very modest. Uh, Paris, as Andreas said, is building very little with the aquatic center, the only permanent. Is that, is that a good thing? just for the games. Yes, because Paris is a city that had almost all the sports venues that you need for the Olympics. The big investment in Paris, much longer term, is for the Grand Paris transport network, which is doing more than ever before to connect the city to the suburbs. They're building 68 new metro stations in the suburbs, a few of which will open for the Olympics. We've just seen the new RER line, you showed it. So this long-term expansion of Paris transports, as Andrea said, is much needed and doesn't really have much to do with the Olympics. This is a plan that was made in 2008, long before Paris knew that it would get these games. So I think the Olympics will come and go leaving, <clears throat> excuse me, leaving the athletes village in Saint-Saint-Denis and the aquatic center nearby as the main legacies, not very significant. I want to ask Yurik Mabedov about uh, Paris, but first let's ask Selena Sykes about uh, Marseille. What's the latest where you are? Well, it's happened, uh, Francois, the cauldron, the Olympics cauldron has been lit. Uh, that uh, honor was handed uh, to Jules, a uh, uh, singer here from Marseille, so fitting a uh, tribute to the city of Marseille. He's now uh, lit uh, the Olympics cauldron. We saw Florent Manodou, uh, the gold uh, medalist uh, uh, winner and a uh, swimmer, carrying the torch uh, with two other French athletes uh, here, uh, going, going down uh, the uh, floating uh, running track uh, together. The cauldron has now been lit, and now we can say that really the Olympic Games has well and truly begun here in France. The festivities uh, will carry on long into the night uh, here in Marseille. We now uh, have uh, a concert that will uh, start uh, shortly for everyone uh, here to enjoy. So uh, the, the early bookmaker's favorite uh, Marseille native uh, Zinedine Zidane to light the cauldron, that proved to be a, a dud. Absolutely, Francois. There's obviously been so much talk about uh, Zinedine Zidane making some sort of surprise appearance here today, but uh, not for now. I don't know whether he may make an appearance uh, tomorrow, say, but uh, we've got lots of other stars to be looking forward to in any case. Uh, Didier Drogba um, and uh, Tony Parker. Didier Drogba, uh, the uh, infamous uh, striker who uh, started at, uh, began his early career uh, with uh, Marseille and made his name at Chelsea, will also have NBA star Tony Parker uh, carrying the flame uh, tomorrow. So lots of other stars to look forward to, Francois, if not Zinedine Zidane. There is, of course, still much speculation about uh, who will be featuring on the 26th uh, of uh, July uh, for the opening ceremony in Paris and who will have that uh, biggest honour uh, of them all uh, to be the last uh, torchbearer in uh, Paris and to light uh, the cauldron uh, in the city uh, of Paris uh, on the 26th of July. So still a lot of surprises in store, I think. 
All right, so pl plenty of time to lay your bets for that one. Uh, Yurik Mamadov, we were talking a moment ago uh, about uh, the investments, uh, which may or may not be really directly linked to the Olympics. There are those talking about uh, coming to the Games during uh, the Olympics. Some feel it's going to be completely swamped. Others say people are going to stay away. What, around Europe, do people want to come for the Olympics or come after the Olympics? So, so it's very challenging, of course, to hold the, the Olympic game in a city like Paris. It's going to be a lot of challenging. There's going to be, you know, things that are not going to be a fit as we want to. But I believe Parisian, from what I heard, they're very excited. It's going to help the economy. They're going to help people to, you know, to visit Paris, about 16, 18 million visitors in Paris. So let's just be focused on the positive part of, of this game and hopefully everything's going to go well. And I believe so. And you, uh, where you are right now in New York, are people telling you they're yes. coming for the Olympics? Uh, to be honest, not really. I haven't heard anybody uh, being excited as much. Actually, they're not excited because they know it's going to be things are more expensive. They're going to be more challenging to go around. So I believe it's going to attract less tourists this year who are not interested in the Olympics specifically. Like a lot of tourists won't go to Paris because of the Olympics, actually. Lindsay Krasnov will see more tourists after the games uh, there, he's saying. You, your thoughts? Uh, from those who I've spoken to in the U.S., it's a little bit half-half. A, a bunch of people I know are coming to Paris for the games. Others are coming just beforehand to kind of get into the spirit. Others are coming afterwards. So I think one of the things about Paris being host is that it's you know, long a tourist magnet, and uh, it can be the icing on the cake for some. Uh, encouraging them to finally come and splurge and do the whole thing. Uh, for others, it's a little bit of a um, you know time to do it, but maybe not during those two or three weeks. All right, so uh, there's uh, the infrastructure questions that we talked about, uh, whether all the venues will be ready, uh, and the most uh, the biggest suspense when it comes to venues is kind of an unlikely one, and that is, uh, the open-air swimming, the long-distance swimming events. They're due to take place in the River Seine. Now, the mayor of Paris has insisted she'll be uh, taking a dip in the river before uh, the games, uh, even though trial runs uh, for the long-distance swimming had to be canceled after heavy rains caused sewage to overflow. These are images uh, from uh, just recently. Anne Hidalgo uh, inaugurating a new water retention basin near the Austerlitz Bridge in the east of Paris. So this work allows episodes of very, very heavy rain, because this is the equivalent of 20 Olympic swimming pools in terms of water storage in volume, and therefore it can guarantee the storage of water during a very violent episode. So Simon Cooper, if you were betting on uh, Zinedine Zidane to light the cauldron in Marseille, you would have lost. Are you willing to place a wager on whether or not Anne Hidalgo and Emmanuel Macron will swim in the Seine before the Olympics? Uh, I don't think Macron would consider that Jupiterian. He says the French president has to be like Jupiter. So uh, not Macron. I think it will probably be OK. Otherwise, they would have given up the bet a long time ago. If there's a lot of rain, then you start to get sewage apparently washing back in. So the hope is for not much rain and then the first swimming in the sand for a century, it would be. It's a long term ambition to clean up the sand. Not sure they'll do it for summer, but my best is yes. Andreas Evergore. I, that, that's a brave bet. I don't know. Is it with or without scuba equipment? I mean, it's, I, <laughs> I, I'd be a bit surprised, but. Because well, when we famously was, remember then Mayor Jacques Chirac. Yeah, sure. I was 25 years ago. Promised yeah. he would swim in the Seine. He never did it. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> honestly, I don't know. I looked at the Seine just today. It looked very, very murky to me. So I think there's a lot of work it's been to be done. Off. Yeah, it has been raining. It, it, it's possible. It's possible. But I, 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 I wouldn't bet on it. I wouldn't count it out, but hey, I'm a swimmer as well, and I'd be a little skeptical about plunging into the sand. Although I think for for the actual events, if it's safe enough to do, I think it would be a really great spectacle. Um, but I myself would be a little dubious. All right, a new movie out this Wednesday in France pokes fun at uh, worst case scenarios. Uh, Jeremy Saint's comedy uh, called The Coubertin Spirit after uh, uh, the Baron Coubertin, uh, who uh, uh, was uh, uh, the founder of the modern games. 
Uh, after 10 days, the French still have no medals. This is the pitch. Their athletes preferring to party at the Olympic Village. The movie's rife with bed bugs and sports washing uh, politicians. Uh, uh, Yurik Mamadov, uh, your thoughts on uh, the French uh, uh, ability to, uh, I guess, poke fun at themselves or to imagine the worst case scenario? Actually, I believe we France have uh, very good athletes and we may, you know, we perform actually very well, especially knowing that we have the pressure of being home. So I believe the pressure of being home and have the, the motivation of showing off and representing France, I believe we're going to be very successful this year. You think it's, it's going to be a good medal haul? Because it, yeah. it, it, it is one of the things about the Olympics, Andreas Evagora, which is, at the end of the day, when the games begin, people talk about the, the Olympic spirit, but they look at that medal table. That is. Oh, yeah. I think France will do well, because host countries almost always do well. London did amazingly well in 2012. Uh, even the Greeks did well in, back in 2004. So, I mean, there's plenty of reasons for that. Money goes in before, there's more infrastructure, there's, you're, you're playing at home, which is a natural advantage. So, yeah, I, I'd agree. I think the French will do I think they're looking to get in the top five. Some are even talking about getting the top four in the medal table. So that will be a great performance. I don't see any reason why the, the French can't do very well. All right, the games are about sports. We can uh, show you images uh, of test events for field hockey that were held recently at the Olympic Stadium for the last Paris Olympics, 1924. This is uh, the Stade de Colombe, uh, and that's where the field hockey events uh, will be taking place. You talked about London 2012. Back then, uh, the British honed in, for instance, on track cycling and uh, had a huge uh, medal haul there. W what's going to be the, the sport where we're going to get us a lot of medals and as a surprise. Well, the, the British honed in on sports where they could win a lot of medals. And there's a great book out by Owen Slot many years ago. Where, but basically, they invested in sports where there's a lot of medals uh, that are very technologically based, so-called sitting sports. So, you know, they won the equestrian, cycling, uh, rowing, because these are sports where you can win a lot of medals for your investment. They invested nothing in basketball because there was no chance we were going to win anything. So I, I would treat that with a... It's like, you know, a pinch of salt. What, where are the French are going to do well? Um, the French are pretty good across the board because they do spread their, their money around in more sports. I think they're well in swimming. They've got a double world champion there. They'll do well in judo, for instance, track. I think the French will be quite good across the board. Across the board? Yeah. The, the French, it should be pointed out, Olympic silver medalists when it comes uh, to bas men's basketball. Uh, but... Uh, also in basketball, uh, Lindsey Krasnov, the U.S. is said to be assembling its greatest squad since the 1992 Dream Team with the likes of uh, LeBron James, Steph Curry, Joel Embiid, whose Cameroonian board could have played for France, but is choosing to play for the United States. Uh, why, why are all the stars coming out for the U.S. this time? So a few things. First, it's an Olympic Games in Paris that holds a lot of attraction even for Team USA members who have already done their national team service. For those who haven't, but who are coming out for the first time, like Steph Curry, I believe is one of them, it's, you know, it's sometimes it's the team is being referred to as the Redeem Team back in the States uh, because the US has not been on the podium since the last Olympics, which they won gold but only by a very few points in the last 10 seconds of that gold medal game. They were knocked out of FIBA World Cup competition. Uh, Germany is the winner. And so uh, the, the desire to kind of claim back glory in a certain sense is fueling a lot on the U.S. side on the men's, uh, the men's basketball tournament. But what makes this Olympic tournament so exciting and one of the hottest tickets both the men's as well as the women's, is that the field of competition has significantly improved since the 1992 original U.S. Dream Team. Um, you look at who's competing in the men's field alone, World Cup champions, Germany, uh, last uh, the Olympic gold medalist, the U.S., France, uh, silver medalist, but also with a very strong string of podium finishes over the past several years. Uh, you also have um, Australia, Canada, who are very strong contenders. And then, of course, there's the issue of South Sudan making their first Olympic appearance mm. um, under Great the general story. presidency of Luol Deng. Um, so it's super competitive. It's not that the U.S. has gotten worse. It's that, you know, as many French players themselves tell me, the rest of the world has gotten better. 
And the same on the women's side as well as three by three. Yeah, the, the USA women's team will also be, by the way, uh, heavy favorites. Uh, Simon Cooper, there'll be a lot of attention uh, on the U.S. team with veteran center Brittany Griner, who spent months in a Russian prison after Vladimir Putin's uh, invasion uh, of Ukraine. Now, uh, Russia is not participating in the women's uh, uh, tournament. But again, it's this question of uh, uh, how much politics plays uh, at an Olympics when you'll see Brittany Griner uh, hit the court. And uh, more broadly, your thoughts on uh, the fact that uh, you know, there's a lot of scrutiny over the fact uh, over how to handle the Russian delegation and, for that matter, uh, calls uh, for a boycott of the Israeli delegation right now. Yeah, I mean, we have two major wars going on a short flight away from these Olympics, and that will hang over the Olympics. I think the Russians and Belarusians are allowed to compete as individuals, but not under the Russian flag. The Ukrainians are very unhappy about that. There will also be a huge amount of fascination with the Ukrainian delegation, especially shooting. Uh, I know that a couple of their shooting champions have been training soldiers to shoot in this war. So I think there'll be an enormous tension and widespread unhappiness if any Russian athlete wins an event. Which is bound to happen, Andrei Sevagor. Well, bound to, I don't know, because there's less than, fewer than 40 uh, Russian athletes. It's very, very limited. Um, no team sports, so hence no basketball. But there will be Russians. There'll be no Russian flags. I talked about symbolism before, and this is there, there's no Russian flag. There's no Russian national anthem. But this, as Simon said, look, we're in the middle of two terrible conflicts. Just look at the football tournament. Ukraine has qualified and Israel has qualified for a quite small football tournament, 16 teams in Paris. Now, we talk about security and so on, but the, we are, who knows what's going to happen? There might be protests. There might, the athletes might protest. I don't, no one knows. You know, it, it, it's a sport. It, it's unknown. But um, the Ukraine situation is going to be very tense because there is a chance, for instance, of a Ukrainian judoka or boxer coming up against a Russian. What's going to happen there? There is a chance of uh, a, 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 an athlete coming up against an Israeli. What's going to happen there? Are they going to boycott? Are they going to stage some kind of process? We don't know. But these are new challenges. And with two particularly awful wars at the moment, it, it's a bigger headache than perhaps it's ever been before. And I would add one thing. This is Perhaps the first real social media Olympics, because the first two, as there weren't any fans in 2020 and 2022, this is going to be very different. And France, whatever you say about France, it's a very open country. You know, people can express themselves pretty much wherever they want, uh, perhaps not compared to some recent hosts. So that's another thing to look out for, because, and again, that's something that organizers can't really control, the whole social media aspect there might be just a small, who knows, a small video, a small comment, a small demonstration that could have quite a huge impact. So that's why I'm, I'm really sitting on the fence because I think it's just very difficult to predict what's going to happen with, with all these things going on. Yurik Mamadov, as an athlete, can you sort of crowd out the outside world and uh, uh, the reality of wars when you're competing, when you're in the Olympic Village, for instance? Or is it something that will weigh on the minds of those competing? You know, we can't deny that there's all this situation going on around the world. But as an athlete, we focus on the task in front of us, which is to compete and win as much medal, you know, possible. So, you know, we're going to be just focused on what is in front of us and try to avoid all politics part involved, you know, with this Olympic Games. L listening to Andreas there, uh, Lindsay Krasnov, the political stakes are high when you, have, when, when you think about it for these games. Well, they are very much, and you know the the, the athletes do are in their their performance bubble. Um, but you know, it's a question of uh, you know the particularly for the host country, the investment in hosting such a games and the ability to show the world your country, its values, what it stands for, and many of the different things that go around it puts a lot of these issues into greater perspective. And I think the the point about you know being very open on social media. Uh, you know, my mind is maybe it's perhaps not Olympians themselves who might be doing as much of the athlete activism uh, in and around the games, but perhaps others uh, who are not directly competing, but who are in support of. Um, I think it's a really interesting mix to very much keep an eye on. 
I mean, something to point out, and, and unfortunately, you have to say it, the, the Olympic movement always talks about unity, but I mean, Vladimir Putin has called the IOC a bunch of fascists. They're his words, not mine. I mean, these are very tough times for the IOC. And this is a personal attack on, on Thomas Bach that, that was made recently. So, you know, this is, this is a very tough job for the IOC. Of course, it's had boycotts in the past, but this is a, a, a real turning point, I think, for the IOC because of the, the, the global political situation is so fraught. How has Simon Cooper, in your view, the IOC uh, handled pressure uh, for boycotts when it comes to Russian athletes, when it comes to uh, uh, calls to boycott Israel? And the IOC always tries to side sidestep controversial issues and not make any enemies and try and keep everyone on board, which they've tried to do this time. It was, you know, unimaginable that Russia could be allowed to compete as a nation, but still a lot of people are unhappy that the IOC has allowed individual Russians to compete, also knowing that the Russian state will make huge propaganda out of any successes achieved in Paris. And so the IOC is complicit in that propaganda. So the IOC is never going to be a brave organization taking strong moral stances that alienate powerful countries like Russia. And uh, right now, uh, if you're the organizing committee, the French organizing committee, what's your biggest concern? What's your biggest area of focus over the next 79 days? Uh, by far, the biggest concern is terrorism. That's the great nightmare. Um, there's no worry about stadiums being ready or whatever. 10 or 15 million people is too many for a city like Paris. They will somehow manage that. The uh, anxiety is how do you keep a city safe for 16 days when it's the most obvious, I hate to say this, most obvious terrorist targets on earth. So uh, everyone will be holding their breath until the end. All right. So that would be that's the worst case scenario. Uh, Selena Sykes, I guess you're witnessing the best case scenario, which is right now a party in Marseille. Yes, Francois, the party is uh, just really beginning here in Marseille. We've had a full day of festivities here, and we've just really seen the, the Marseille spirit, as so many locals have been telling me today, with the sun out, uh, everyone out and enjoying themselves. Uh, so many friendly people coming up uh, to, to us and speaking and uh, really expressing their, their pride uh, uh, of uh, Marseille, for Marseille, and uh, to have welcomed uh, the flame here. The party is only just getting started. We'll uh, shortly be having a, a concert for everyone to enjoy it here at uh, the old uh, Porter with, uh, from what I understand, uh, a medley of uh, French rap. It's not uh, my forte, Francois, but we'll have a medley of uh, uh, French rapper. Uh, as we saw, was a bit of the theme here this evening with uh, Jules, the French rapper from Marseille, uh, having that... Uh, Big honor of being the first uh, French personality to uh, light uh, the Olympics cauldron here at the Old Port. And I'm sure that that uh, beautiful rainbow behind you uh, is a good omen for things to come. Uh, Selena Sykes, many thanks uh, for joining us uh, from the, uh, the, that Mediterranean port city. I want to thank uh, Yurik Mamadov. Good luck to you when you carry the Olympic torch uh, for being with us uh, from uh, New York City. Uh, Lindsay Krasnov, Andres uh, Evagora, Simon Cooper, thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.